الله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد we are still doing our introductory uh, lectures before actually jumping into the life and times of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And all of these introductory lectures is background information and motivation for why we should be studying the seerah. So today, inshaAllah Ta'ala, we will begin about discussing what exactly is the seerah and why should we study the seerah. And we'll try to mention something about pre-Islamic Arabia. So we're going to set the stage and we're going to continue next week and the week after that, setting the stage for the coming of the Prophet ﷺ. So before we begin with the birth of the Prophet ﷺ, we need to explain the world at his time. And so we're going to begin by doing that today and continuing for the next week or two the story of Ibrahim and the benefit we can derive and so on and so forth. So we begin by talking about the word seerah. What does the word seerah mean? The word seerah comes from the Arabic ber- verb sara yasiru sayran, which means to traverse or to journey. So the word seerah actually comes from the verb that means to travel. And the reason why seerah, meaning the biography of a person, is called seerah, it is because you are traveling his journey. You are walking in his path, you are following his footsteps. So when we study the life and times of the Prophet ﷺ, it is as if we are following in his footsteps, it is as if we are traveling in his journey. And that is why the seerah or the biography of a person is called the seerah because you are walking in his footsteps. Now, even though the Arabs would call seerah the biography of any person, as soon as the Prophet ﷺ came, Muslim scholars used it exclusively for the biography of the best human being. And so, no scholar says seerah, except that he means the biography of the life and times of the incidents that have been during the life of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Now, in order to understand the seerah, as I said, you don't begin with the birth of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. You must begin with the world at his time. And that is why every single book of seerah, from the most classical books up until the modern ones, they have a number of introductory sections, and we're going to begin with that today after we summarize some of the benefits of studying the seerah. Why study the seerah? Why should you be interested in the seerah? Why spend our time coming here and understanding the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam? Well, the benefits are numerous. First and foremost, Allah has commanded us to know this man. This is an obligation that Allah has put upon us. We have to know this person. And there are over 50 verses in the Quran that command us to take the Prophet as an example. Of them, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُوا اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآقِرَةِ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ Indeed, there is for you, فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ In the Messenger of Allah, أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ An exemplary manner, a perfect conduct. Uswa means something you follow. Hasana means a perfect. So you have in the Prophet Sallallahu the perfect example to follow. And therefore, the study of the life and times of the Prophet Sallallahu is the study of somebody we need to follow. And the amazing thing, no matter which angle you look at the life and times of the Prophet Sallallahu you will benefit from that. So no doubt, the number one angle we look at it, in terms of religion, in terms of how we worship Allah. Also, we look at the seerah in terms of manners and morals, in terms of mercy and tenderness. Also, we look at the seerah in terms of leadership. What did the Prophet do as a leader? We look at the seerah in terms of how he was as a father and a husband. And we will find benefit in this. So no matter which angle you look at the life and times, the purpose of risala, the purpose of Allah sending prophets, is that we have a living example to follow. Allah tells us in the Quran that if we had wanted, we could have sent angels. There's a verse in the Quran that if we had wanted, we could have sent angels. But what would you have done if we had sent angels? You would have rejected. You would have rejected it. Why? Because you would have said, we can't be like that. These are not our species. How can we follow them? So of the Perfection of Allah's wisdom is that He sends human beings, flesh and blood, people like ourselves, born of women, 
married and having children just like us. But the difference is they are chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they are made role models and examples. Another blessing of studying the seerah is that the seerah is the number one way to increase our love for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The number one way, there is really no other way as effectively and as powerfully to increase our love for the Prophet than by studying his life and his times. And this is a sad fact of our ummah that unfortunately we have neglected this study and we have sidelined it. And most of our children are ignorant completely of the seerah of the Prophet They don't even know the names of his children. They don't even know the basic dates. When did he immigrate? How old was he when Wahi came down? And yet they know so much of this dunya that it is embarrassing. It is embarrassing for us as parents that our children know so much of movie stars and actors and, and, and sports uh, personalities. And they have no clue as to the real person whom they should know about. And so by studying the seerah, our love for the Prophet ﷺ increases. And conversely, it demonstrates our love. It's a two-way street. When you study, your love goes up. In order for your love to go up, you need to study. And if you truly love this man, you will study him. And that is because a sign of loving someone is to want to know more about them. A sign of loving somebody is to want to know more about that person. This is human nature. So for example, when I'm traveling, I call up my children, I say, what did you do today? I mean, who cares what they've done? That doesn't affect me. What did you have for breakfast? I ask my children. Who cares? I mean, it's not going to affect me. But this is a sign of love. Because when you love somebody, you want to know everything about them. So anybody who claims to love the Prophet ﷺ, but he doesn't study his life and times, Wallahi, the fact that he doesn't study is a sign he doesn't love. If you claim you love this man, and yet you don't care to study him. You don't care to read his biography. You don't care to find out facts about him. What type of love is this? This is not a love that we understand as human beings. So, to study the seerah is a sign of love. And through studying the seerah, we increase our love. It's a circle. The more we love, the more we study. The more we study, the more we love. Understanding the seerah, also a third benefit. Understanding the seerah also helps us to understand the Qur'an. Because the Qur'an is a very complex book, it's a very profound book. And it cannot be understood without context. You cannot understand without context. So when you hear, for example, I just recited right now, Your Lord has not abandoned you, nor has He shown you any harshness. You will not understand this verse. Until you understand the seerah, when it was revealed. Why was it revealed? The context of its revelation. That the Prophet was facing persecution. And he was wondering, why isn't Allah helping me? Why isn't the Nasr of Allah coming? Why isn't the Wahi coming? Why isn't the Quran coming? For weeks, no Quran came down. And the Prophet began thinking, maybe my Lord has abandoned me. What is and this is early on, the first year of revelation. The first year of revelation, and shaitan is giving him bad thoughts. And so immediately Allah reveals, وَالضُّحَى وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا سَجَى مَا وَدَّعَكَ وَالضُّحَى Sign of optimism. Duha is what? What is duha? The breaking of the light, right? To this day amongst humanity, what does duha signify? New day. Light is coming. Right? So this is an optimistic sign. And Allah is telling him, مَا وَدَّعَكَ رَبُّكَ مَا قَلَى وَلَا الْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنَ الْأُولَى Be patient. What's going to happen is better than what you're having now. Right? It's the beginning of the day. The dawn is coming. The sun is coming. So until you understand the seerah, the surah doesn't make any sense to you. So by studying the seerah, the Qur'an gains meaning, profundity. Without the seerah, the Qur'an is without context. Without context, you will never appreciate the Qur'an. Another benefit of studying the seerah, the seerah raises our hopes, lifts our spirit, and blesses us with optimism. Especially in our times when we're facing Islamophobia, we're facing a little bit of persecution. Wallahi, to call it persecution is, is even embarrassing when we look at what the Prophet ﷺ and the early Sahaba suffered. We in America are not being persecuted in that sense. Nonetheless, times have changed from the last 10 years. And things are happening now, we're facing a little bit of the heat. We need a source of direction, a source of optimism. And by studying the seerah, we can understand that the people before us suffered even more. And we compare our trials and tribulations to their trials and tribulations. And in fact, 
a beautiful point here. The Quran tells us that Allah is telling the Prophet ﷺ the stories of the earlier Prophets, i.e. the earlier seerahs. Why? وَكُلَّنْ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ مِنْ أَنْبَاءِ الرُّسُلِ مَا نُثَبِّتُ بِهِ فؤادك. We are going to recite to you the stories of the previous Prophets in order that your hearts attain affirmation. نُثَبِّتْ بِهِ فؤادك. We're going to make you feel more firm, increase your optimism. So, think about this. Our Prophet ﷺ heard the stories of the earlier Prophets. What did that do to him? Gave him more optimism, increased his Iman. How about us then? Don't we deserve even more so that our Iman goes up when we study the life and times of the Prophet ﷺ? So the studying of the life and times of the previous generations of the Prophets of Allah, it brings about an immediate benefit. لِنُثَبِّتَ بِهِ فُؤَادَكَ To resolve, to affirm your chest, i.e. to increase your Iman. Yet another benefit of studying the seerah, and this is something many of us don't really uh, think about, the seerah itself is a miracle of the Prophet wasallam. When somebody asks you, what are the miracles of the process, and we start thinking the splitting of the moon, the talking of the tree, this, that, this, that, and we don't think that, that in fact, his whole life is a miracle from beginning to end. His whole life is an indication that he was a prophet of Allah. Coming from where he came, with the education or lack of education that he had, and yet coming forth with the message, the profundity, the scripture, the eloquence of the Qur'an. Where did this come from? In addition to that, his patience, his perseverance, his success, coming in the middle of a pagan, ancient civilization that had no, there was no civilization. They didn't even have a script. They didn't have two-story buildings. They didn't have a library. They couldn't even read and write. And yet the Prophet ﷺ came from the midst of a backward, uneducated, uncivilized, barbaric nation. We're going to talk about this next week. They were really a barbaric nation. And within 50 years, within 20 years, look what happened. Within 50 years, Islam began to spread. Within 100 years, it ruled the world. This is a miracle from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the seerah is the beginning of that miracle. How he lived, the power that he wielded, and yet the simplicity with which he lived his life. The sacrifice that the Sahaba would have done had he asked them to do, but he didn't. And it is impossible for a human not to be affected by that power, by that luxury, by that wealth, unless there is really a divine sincerity in him. A pure sincerity that this is being done for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the famous scholar Ibn Hazm from Andalus, the famous Andalusian scholar, Ibn Hazm says that, Wallahi, if the Prophet وسلم, had not been given any miracle other than his life and his times, it would have been sufficient to prove that he's a Prophet from Allah. If he hadn't been given any other miracle other than his seerah. His seerah is the best indication that he is a prophet from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course there are multiple facets here. His own life and times. How he revolutionized Arabia. And how he changed the entire world from where he came from, a humble origin, a shepherd of Mecca. And what happened with the messages that he came with, immediately becoming within 20 years. And, and we're going to get to this point, I'm jumping, jumping the gun here. But nobody could have ever predicted that a group would come from Arabia and destroy the Persian Empire and start knocking on the doors of the Roman Empire and start diminishing it until finally it wiped that. It, nobody could have ever predicted that a group would come from Arabia with a new religion, a new theology, a force that cannot be equaled with the mighty empires of Rome and Persia. And yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened up the doors and Allah Azza wa Jal allowed these group of people who were less educated and less even, if you like, civilized, meaning the Sahaba did not have the type of civilization that the Romans and Persians did. They didn't have the weaponry. And yet Allah Azza wa Jal blessed them because they were Muslims, because they had this religion. So by studying the life and times of the Prophet ﷺ, we see his miracle. We see the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent him. Another benefit of studying the seerah, is that the seerah lays out a precise methodology for the revival of the ummah. You know, there are so many groups out there, we call them these Islamist groups, trying to revive the ummah. Each one has his own ideology, his own methodology. Well, why don't we begin with the methodology of the Prophet Let us see how he began. 
If you want to bring about izzah and honor and glory, let us look at what the Prophet ﷺ did. Because he began in the middle of nothing. He began literally from scratch. Literally from zero. And within his lifetime, look what happened. So you want to see a methodology of revival? We look at the ummah today and our hearts bleed. We look at the ummah today and we see what is happening and, we're, and we wonder why, oh Allah, why is this happening? And we ask, how can we revive the state of the ummah? The response by studying the seerah, we see a methodology, a plan of revival. By studying the seerah, we also see the life and times of the best generation who ever lived. And that is a generation of the sahaba. The best generation who ever lived, as we firmly believe, radiyallahu anhum wa radu an. Allah says this in over eight or nine verses in the Quran. Radiyallahu anhum wa radu an. Allah is pleased with them. They are pleased with Allah. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the best of all generations has been my generation. Khayru ummatin qarni. The best ummah is my ummah, meaning that of the Sahaba. And Ibn Mas'ud said, that Allah looked at the hearts of His servants and He chose the purest and the brightest heart to be that of the Prophet Muhammad And then He chose the, the purest and brightest hearts and He made them the Sahaba of the Prophet Muhammad So by studying the seerah, we study the stories of Abu Bakr and Umar, the stories of Anas and Jabir, the stories of Sa'd ibn Mu'adh and Talha and Zubair, and we, our Iman goes up as well. These were legendary people. These were people, their life and times, they inspire us. Their sacrifices, their struggles, their perseverance, their patience, each and every one of them is a role model for us. And there is a, a, an athar uh, that uh, it might be slightly weak, but the athar concept is authentic, that my sahaba are like the stars. My Sahaba are like the stars, whichever one you follow, you're going to be guided. And the point here is that the Sahaba are role models for us, each and every one of us. Of the benefits of studying the seerah, is that the seerah brings about knowledge with which we can defend the honor of our Prophet the Prophet's honor has always been attacked from day one. The Quraysh fabricated things against him. Sahirun kathab. They said this is ifkun muftara. They said he is a madman, he's a magician, he's a poet, he's this, he's that. Because nobody can explain how the Quran came. You have to invent some explanation, right? Where, where did this unlettered shepherd get the Quran from? Even the Arabs, the Quraysh had to explain. So they invent the most preposterous claims. They said he's a magician. They said he's a madman. They said he's this. They said he's that. Well, the propaganda began back then. It continues to this day. And each one of the charges that the Prophet ﷺ was accused of, the Quran defends against it. And each one of the charges later people invent, we need to turn to the seerah and defend against the Prophet ﷺ. In our times, how many people are saying that our Prophet ﷺ was a bloodthirsty terrorist? This is exactly what they're saying. They're saying he was a womanizer, he married this, he married that. My dear brothers and sisters, if you want to defend Rasulullah, how do you expect to do so when you don't know his life and times? If you want to defend your Prophet, how are you going to do so when you don't know whether these things are true or not. And if certain elements are true, how do we understand them? And when we put them in context, then insha'Allah ta'ala, it is easier to explain. So by studying the seerah, we will be able to defend the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And there is no way to defend him other than by studying the seerah. And that is why the early scholars of Islam, the Sahaba tabi'un tabi'un, they would teach the seerah just like they would teach all of the other sciences. Ali ibn al Hussein, the great grandson of the Prophet, ﷺ, he said, We would teach our children maghazi, meaning the maghazi is the early word for seerah, the expeditions of the Prophet, ﷺ, just like we would teach them the Quran. You see, this is how they would raise their children seerah and the Quran. You need to teach your children the Qur'an and you need to teach them the seerah along with the Qur'an. And so the curriculum in early Islam was really composed of Qur'an and seerah of the Prophet wasallam. And I encourage all of you to start the same with your own children. That instead of reading bedtime stories of ancient Greek pagans, right? Why don't we talk about the life and times of our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Talk about the Sahaba. And there are so many books of seerah for the children that these are the stories that our children should be uh, raised upon and listen to and hear. So to summarize the benefits of studying the seerah, we can say that the study of the seerah is in fact the study of the best 
and the best and the best and the best. What do I mean by this? It is the study of the life and times of the single best human being who ever lived. Now we firmly believe as Muslims that the Prophet ﷺ, all the Prophets are good and pious and holy, and the Prophet ﷺ is the best of them. As he said in a hadith, Ana Sayyidu waladi Adama yawm al qiyamati wala fakhr. I am the Sayyid, I am the leader, the paragon of virtue of the children of Adam, and I'm not saying this out of arrogance, wala fakhr. I'm not saying this to boast. This is a factual statement that Allah has told me. So by studying the seerah, we study the best person. And the best time, because the best time is the time of the Sahaba. The best people are the people of the Sahaba. The best place, and that is Mecca and Medina. These are the holiest cities on earth. And it is the seerah that brought prominence to these two cities. We firmly believe that Mecca was holy, but who believed it was holy? Who knew it was holy? Who cared it was holy until the seerah came? And as for Medina, it became holy in the life of the Prophet The Prophet said, I am making Medina holy like Ibrahim made Mecca holy. By the permission of Allah. I am declaring Medina to be holy like Ibrahim declared Mecca to be holy. So the seerah is the life and times of the best human. In the best era. Amongst the best people. And living in the best of all cities. In every angle it is the best of the best of the best of the best. The best person, the best time, the best place and the best generation. And therefore studying the Prophet ﷺ's life and times is studying our religion. It is studying the rise of the phenomenon of our religion, it is studying how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought about the revolution of Islam. He brought about an entire change of mind, how Islam changed the world. And by studying these 23 years of the life of the Prophet it's only 23 years from his risala. 23 years, the miracle of the seerah will benefit us in each and every aspect. The next question that arises is, where do we study the seerah from? What is the primary or what are the primary sources of seerah? Now here I am preaching to you in Memphis, Tennessee, 1429 years or 32 years after the Hijrah of the Prophet. Where did I get this information from? How do I know what happened? So the question arises very briefly, I'm not going to go into too much detail. What are the sources of the seerah of the Prophet? Who can tell me the number one source of seerah of the Prophet The most, the Quran. The hadith is number two. The Quran. The number one source is Quran. And this is a source that is overlooked by many of the people. It is overlooked by many of the people. Immediately jump to, is it Ibn Ishaq? Is it Ibn Hisham? Is it this? The number one source of seerah is the Quran. Because the Qur'an was revealed during the seerah, so it's catering to situations that arose during the seerah. And the Qur'an references almost every single major incident in the life of the Prophet wasallam. In fact, even before his time, such as for example, Alam nashrah alaka sadrak. The, the reference here is to when he was five years old. When the Jibreel came and visited him. Alam nashrah alaka sadrak wa wada'an anka wizrak alladhi anqada dhaharak. So the seerah references every single major story in the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And even before, is there any story mentioned even before he was born? Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashab al-feel. Bi ashab al-feel was before the Prophet was born. And Allah mentions it in the Quran, ashab al-feel. So the seerah tells us stories from the beginning all the way up until the end. اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتممت عليكم نعمتي ورضيت لكم الإسلام دينا. One of the last verses revealed the completion of the benefits of the Quran. The Quran is the best source of seerah for many reasons. For many reasons. First and foremost is the speech of Allah. So Allah is telling this to us. So can we doubt the speech of Allah? And the eloquence of the Quran is something that is unparalleled. The eloquence is simply unparalleled. How beautifully Allah describes Badr and Uhud. How beautifully Allah describes the feelings of the Sahaba and the Munafiqun even. So another benefit of the Quran, any historian will record the outward. The Quran records the inward. The Quran tells us that 
إذ تصعدون ولا تلون على أحد والرسول يدعوكم في أخراكم right the Quran tells us that you were terrified that day that your throats were your hearts were in your throats the Quran tells us you became cowards the Quran tells the munafiqun you are scared that Allah will expose you who can expose the hearts of the people other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So the Quran is an amazing source of seerah. The eloquence, the power, the beauty, and ilm al ghaib The Quran explains to us phenomena we would not have understand. Right? Badr. Allah says in the Quran, we will reveal thalathati alafim min malaika munzaleen. We sent down 3,000 angels. Don't worry, we're going to help you. Uhud. Allah explained the, the, the disaster and catastrophe. Hudaybiyyah. On and on. Every single incident. The Quran tells us ilm al ghaib. And there is no source of finding this out other than the Quran. However, one of the issues, we never say problems, one of the issues of the Quran is that, of course, it's not chronological. Right? So we don't know the reference of the Quran simply because Baqarah, Ali Imran, Nisa, Ma'idah are not arranged chronologically. Right? They're arranged according to how the Prophet want them to be arranged. So Baqarah is an early Madani surah. It comes first. And Iqra, which is the first surah, is the 96th in the Quran. So it's not arranged chronologically. And another problem is that a lot of times you don't see the reference mentioned. So Allah Azza wa Jal doesn't mention the word Uhud. We need to know that Ali Imran was revealed for Uhud. That Anfal was revealed for Badr. We need to know this. And it's without, so the seerah and the Quran go hand in hand. In that you need the seerah to understand the Quran, you need the Quran to understand the seerah. So the two go hand in hand. So this is the first source, and it is the most prized source, it is the most eloquent source, and so on and so forth. The second source of seerah, as our sister pointed out, is hadith. And in fact, every hadith is one snapshot of the seerah, is it not? What is a hadith? It's a saying of the Prophet ﷺ. And what is the saying of the Prophet ﷺ except one incident? And so in one sense, every single hadith is a snapshot of the seerah. But of course, when we mean hadith, we primarily mean those that describe some incidents. Somebody came, somebody did, this happened. And so from the hadith, and there are lots of books of hadith, lots of books. And the most famous ones, as you should know, are six of them. They are called the six famous books, Al-Qutub al-Sitta. Uh, somebody called them, as, some call them As-Sihah al-Sitta, but that is not precise because they're not all Sahih. But the Kutub is Sitta, these are the primary books, but there are lots of other books of hadith. There are dozens of other books of hadith. The third source of seerah is books written specifically for seerah. And the first people to begin writing books of seerah were the sons of the Sahaba, the Sahaba's children. Can you imagine if your father was a Sahabi and he's telling you all of these stories of the Prophet ﷺ and there's so many, you begin to write them down. And of the greatest of those who wrote was Urwa, the son of Az-Zubayr. Urwa, the son of Az-Zubayr. Urwa is the son of the Sahabi, the grandson of the Sahabi. His mother is a Sahabiya. His grandmother is a Sahabiya. His brother is a Sahabi. But he was born after the death of the Prophet ﷺ. So he's not a Sahabi. His brother is even a Sahabi, but he's not a Sahabi. And his aunt is Aisha. His aunt is Aisha, the wife of the Prophet ﷺ. So Urwa is one of the primary narrators of hadith and fiqh and tafsir and of seerah. Because he has access to Aisha. Nobody had access to Aisha. He has, he's a mahram. Aisha doesn't need to wear hijab in front of him. So Urwa is the primary narrator from Aisha. And lots of details of the Prophet ﷺ come from Urwa because Aisha tells him those details. And it is said that Urwa wrote a small pamphlet of the seerah. Also, the son of Uthman ibn Affan, his name was Abban. Abban ibn Uthman ibn Affan. The son of Uthman ibn Affan, he died 105 Hijra. He also wrote a little booklet of Sirah. And some other booklets were written until finally a great scholar came by the name of Ibn Shihab al-Zuhri. Ibn Shihab al-Zuhri, who died 129 Hijra. And he wrote one of the first early treatises of Sirah. Now, none of these books has existed, none of them anymore. We simply have references in later books of these earlier books. Why aren't they existent? Very easy, very simple reason. When later books came, they absorbed the earlier treatises. So 
Abban is saying, my father told me, my father told me, my father told me. Urwa is saying, Aisha narrated, my father narrated, my uncle narrated. Three, four people. Imagine somebody comes and he takes Abban and Urwa and other books, and then he says, let me make a bigger book. Once the bigger book is written, who needs Urwa and who needs Abban anymore, right? You might as well copy that book. And realize in those days, there were no printing presses. In those days, if you wanted a book, what would you do? You would sit there and write it yourself cover to cover. So if you had to choose one book, you would choose the bigger ones. You would choose the ones with more details. And so it's a sad case for us now. We wish we had those early books, but unfortunately we don't have them. But we do have books that were written in the very next generation. Very early. And this shows us that Seerah was compiled by and large even before Hadith. By and large. Because they wanted to emphasize Seerah more than anything else. And... The greatest, I'm being very simplistic here because obviously we can go where there's lots of PhDs written about sources of seerah. I'm summarizing in a short sentences. The greatest scholar of seerah is a name most of you would have heard of, Ibn Ishaq. Sirat Ibn Ishaq. Ibn Ishaq, his name is Muhammad Ibn Ishaq and he was born around 85 Hijrah. Now think about it, 85 Hijrah. Which means he's living in Medina, he's born in Medina. Right? This is where the Prophet ﷺ lived and died. This is where the children of the Sahaba are. He grew up around the children of the Sahaba and the grandchildren of the Sahaba. 85 Hijrah is very early, right? And the Sahaba lived up until around 100, 110 Hijrah. You know, Jab and others, they died 90 Hijrah. So, it, Muhammad ibn Ishaq, or ibn Ishaq for short, he met the sons of the Sahaba. Maybe even he saw some of the Sahaba. Maybe. But it's very early. 85 Hijrah is when he's born, is very early. And he began writing everything that he heard. And he just had a passion for the seerah. So he began writing everything and began compiling it in chronological order. Unlike the earlier treatises, they weren't in chronological order. Ibn Ishaq began saying, well this happened in early Makkah, and this middle Makkah, this late Makkah, then the Hijrah. And then he go so he compiled a very large book. And just to be on the safe side, he even traveled to other cities where some of the Sahaba had went. Basra, Kufa. He went and traveled there to discover the stories of Ibn Mas'ud who traveled to Kufa. To, to the, the stories of uh, the Sahaba who had traveled to other places in the world. So he traveled to other lands as well. But his primary source was always in Medina. And one of the best things about Muhammad ibn Ishaq is he compiled everything with the chain of narrators. What is the chain of narrators called in Islam? Isnad. Isnad. Isnad is the chain of narrators. The chain of narrators is a uniquely Islamic phenomenon. It does not exist in any other religion or culture. It's a uniquely Islamic phenomenon. And the chain of narrators tells us where the story came from. Because in Islam, we always wanted to verify authenticity. We didn't just base our religion, our superstitions and fables. Who told you this? Who told you that? Who told him that? Who told him that? All the way back to the Prophet ﷺ. So we compile the narrators. Ibn Ishaq from so and so, from so and so, from so and so. Back to the son of Jabir, from Jabir, from the Prophet ﷺ. So we have a whole isnad. And we know every person, when he was born, when he died, how, how good was he of a Muslim? Was he a good memory? Or was he a poor memory? And therefore we can judge the isnad. And so the Prophet ﷺ, uh, uh, Ibn Ishaq began compiling the life of the Prophet ﷺ. And he wrote a Massive book. It was so big, it was, they said it was in 10 15 volumes. And this is in, a, and he died, Ibn Ishaq died 150 Hijrah. So he lived from 85 to 150, very early on. It was so big that it was difficult to copy. And so one of his uh, students, if you like, came along, not a direct student, a student of a student, and his name was Ibn Hisham. These are two names most Muslims are aware of Ibn Ishaq and Ibn Hisham. Right? And Ibn Hisham, his name was Abdul Malik Ibn Hisham. Abdul Malik Ibn Hisham. And Ibn Hisham died 213 Hijrah. Now, the reason why I'm going into detail here is that the average Muslim should be aware of these two source books of the seerah Ibn Ishaq and Ibn Hisham. Right? I know this is not directly the seerah, we'll get there, but you need to know some books. Where does the seerah come from? Primarily, the number one source is Ibn Ishaq and then Ibn Hisham. Now, what's the difference between Ibn Hisham and Ibn Ishaq? Very simple. Ibn Hisham realized that Ibn Ishaq is too big, 10, 12 volumes. So he decided to summarize it. Ibn Hisham did not add anything, he subtracted. He did not rearrange, he deleted. 
Ibn Hisham simply cut, 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 cut. Lots of cuts he made. And he made it into, now Ibn Hisham is available in four volumes. I have an edition, four volumes, let's say. So they say he made it maybe into a half or a third of the original size. Now somebody will say, why did he do that? Why didn't he leave it a large book? You need to realize in those days they didn't have printing press. If you wanted the book, you'd have to write it cover to cover. And he realized this was too much detail. And also one of the things of Ibn Ishaq, he was one of the first people to write a history of humanity. He began from Adam, he worked his way down, Ibrahim, uh, Nuh, Ibrahim, Musa, and then he made his way to the Prophet And Ibn, Ibn Hisham said, you know what, we don't need all of this, let's begin with the life and times of the Prophet So he deleted the entire section about early history. And he deleted a lot of other information that he felt was not that, uh, not that useful. And so over time, people began copying Ibn Hisham. And if you want to buy a copy of the book, you have to buy Sirat Ibn Hisham. You're not going to find Sirat. Which one? Ibn Ishaq. You're not going to find that. Okay, you're not going to find that because it is now gone missing. However, just a side point for the little bit more interested or enthused amongst you, there was a very, very famous scholar, Indian, <laughs> by the name of Dr. Hamidullah. Dr. Hamidullah. Very famous scholar. And he lived a very ripe old age, around 93. He just passed away five years ago, six years, no, actually a little bit, six, seven years ago. And he, he was from India, and then he went to France. And he became one of the greatest scholars uh, in what we call Orientalism, or, or you know, specializing, studying of Islam amongst non-Muslims. He wrote, book, uh, wrote books in French and in English, and he became a great researcher. And Dr. Hamidullah discovered many manuscripts. A lot of these manuscripts ended up in Berlin, in Paris, in London. Now how could ancient manuscripts end up over there? Many reasons, of them is colonialism. When the West came and they started purchasing art items and they started purchasing ancient things, they have the money, they have the political power. And so the sad fact of the matter is some of the most earliest Qur'ans, we find them in Paris. The earliest Mus'haf that we have is in Paris. And another early Mus'haf is in London. And so on and so forth. So this is just the reality of the state of our ummah. That when they left, they took all of these treasures with them. Some of them were purchased. Some of them were literally just taken by force. So after World War I, after all of this, and there's a lot of manuscripts. Uh, and it's not just World War I. I mean, to be fair, a lot of them were purchased. So people, when you have pounds, sterling, or American dollars, people are willing to sell items. You know? And so a lot of these items were purchased by rich businessmen who just valued it as art. So lots of manuscripts. And to this day, by the way, the majority of early ancient manuscripts are found in, let's say, Germany. One of the most largest repositories of manuscripts are in Germany, because Germans had an interest in Islam in the 18th century. So Hamidullah is obviously a Muslim. He reads fluent Arabic and whatnot. So he's going through all of these treasures in Germany, in Paris, in London, and he discovered a lot of manuscripts. One of the manuscripts he discovered was a partial copy of Ibn Ishaq. The Ummah had thought Ibn Ishaq is missing and gone. The Ummah had thought, Khalas, there is no more Ibn Ishaq. He discovered around one-fourth of Ibn Ishaq. And so he edited it and published it. And when now we compare, this is why it's good to have the earlier sources. Because then we can show the people, look, Ibn, Ibn Hisham didn't just invent Sirah. He's taking it from Ibn Ishaq. So when he compared Ibn Ishaq with Ibn Hisham, he found that exactly as Ibn Hisham said, he simply cut off around half or around one third. He just cut off. What did he cut off? Long poetry, uh, the lineage of the Arabs. So every time Ibn Ishaq would mention a name, he'd take him back to, let's say, Nuh alayhi salam. Okay? Lineage of 50, 60 people. So Ibn Hisham goes, look, you know what, let's just go back four or five people, cut the rest off. So when he compared the two, he found, yes, Ibn Hisham was accurate in what he did. And therefore, we can now say, Alhamdulillah, for sure, when we read Ibn Hisham, we're reading something written around a hundred years after the Prophet ﷺ passed away. Amazing. Wallah, it's amazing. Far before any book of hadith. Because Bukhari died 256, Muslim died uh, 261, and so on and so forth. So Ibn, Ibn uh, Ishaq died 150. He wrote the book around 130 or so. So literally around a hundred years after the death of the Prophet ﷺ, a little bit more than a hundred, we have the majority or the bulk of Ibn Ishaq preserved through Ibn uh, Hisham. So uh, the third source of Sirah is the books specifically written for the Sirah. The fourth source of, the, of Sirah are the books written about the characteristics of the Prophet In Arabic the word is 
Shama'il. Shama'il. A number of early authors, they wanted to describe the Prophet and they wrote books about his description. Of course, the most famous, you all know this book. What is the most famous Shama'il? Shama'il? Tirmidhi. Shama'il of Tirmidhi. This is the most famous Shama'il. Shama'il of Tirmidhi. Uh, but there were many Shama'il written. And Shama'il is a genre of books that deals with the looks, the characteristics, the manners, the possessions, the houses of the Prophet. It's called Shama'il. Specialities. Another source of Sirah are the books written about the miracles of the Prophet ﷺ in Arabic called Dala'il. There's another genre of books, Dala'il. And there are many books of miracles written. So by looking at the miracles, you can extract Sirah. Now, the most famous book of Dala'il is called Dala'il al-Nubu'a of al-Bayhaqi. And this is around in 12 volumes. It's a massive book encyclopedia. This is Dala'il al-Nubu'a of al-Bayhaqi. And then there are other sources of Sirah. There's histories of the Sahaba. So people recorded the histories of the Sahaba. By studying the histories of the Sahaba, you extract Sirah. And then finally, we'll mention the histories of Makkah and Medina. People wrote Tariq Makkah and Tariq Medina. And so by reading the tariqs of Makkah and Medina, we extract Sirah. And so these are the primary sources of uh, Sirah. To this, modern people have added uh, sources that were not found in Muslim lands. And this is very difficult and rare, but there's a new genre of research in academia and in Islamic studies here in America and the Western world. What did the Romans say about the Arabs at the time? What did the Persians say? What did the other civilizations say? And what, what stories did those Arabs tell the Romans? And this is recorded bits and pieces. Uh, and this is another complicated topic, but um, uh, this is not the time and place to get into that. But some of the sources that now we have access to, earlier scholars did not have access to. So these are the sources of the uh, Sirah. Now we begin talking about pre-Islamic Arabia. Pre-Islamic Arabia. And we began by mentioning who exactly the Arabs were. This is a topic now of genealogy, a topic of ethnicity. Who are the Arabs that the Prophet ﷺ appeared amongst? And this is a topic that Ibn Ishaq himself begins with. The beginning of Ibn Ishaq is the types of Arabs. Who are the Arabs? So, let us begin. The Arabs amongst you pay attention especially. This is your own lineage. <laughs> Some of you it is your lineage. Others, Allahu Alam. <laughs> I say this because... I say this because most of the Arabs of our times, uh, they might not trace their roots back to the classical Arabs. So for example, when the Arabs conquered Egypt, the Egyptians at the time were not the descendants of these classical Arabs. When the Arabs conquered Sham and Syria, they were Romans. But eventually the descendants of these Romans became Muslims and they started speaking Arabic. And so what happened was what we have now is that the Arab ethnicity is not what it used to be. And I don't mean this as any type of, it's awkward talking about Arabs when I'm not an Arab. So I, I mean nothing against the Arabs, believe me. Okay, I love the Arabs, I'm the disclaimer. Uh, I love the Arabs, nothing against the Arabs. But the Arabs in our times, they are not the Arabs that we're talking about. The Arabs we're talking about trace their ancestry to specific people. Most Arabs in our times are not descendants of those people. They have become Arab through culture, through assimilation, through language, but they're not, now some of them are, so some of them they can trace their lineage back to these people. Those are still, this is the Arabs that we are talking about. So, the scholars have divided Arabs into two broad categories. Eventually I'm going to need a PowerPoint, but I was lazy today, I didn't do it, I didn't want to hook it up. Two broad categories. You might have this, I'm sure, right? You have this, right? Okay. The first of these categories are the extinct Arabs. Al-Arab al-Ba'ida. Extinct means there are obviously no more. And these are the earliest civilizations that lived in Arabia. Pre-Islam by thousands of years. They're called the extinct Arabs. They're just a remnant of history. These are the earliest civilizations of humanity in the Arabian Peninsula. And the Quran mentions some of their stories. Such as, who can tell me? Ad and Thamud. These are two of the earliest civilizations. They have nothing to do with the later Arabs. They're simply called Arabs because they lived in the land that was later called Arabia. It wasn't called Arabia when they were living there. And as far as we know, Thamud is the earliest humanity that we find in the Arabian Peninsula. 
We don't find any remnants of humanity before Thamud. Modern archaeological evidence suggests that the people of Thamud flourished around 3000 BCE. In other words, 5,000 years ago. Flourished, which means they existed maybe 1,000 years before then. We have documented evidence of the Thamud flourishing 5,000 years ago. And we have the Madain of Salih. The, we have the civilization of people of, of Salih, which was after Thamud. We have them, we see, we can see, we can walk into their territories and we can see their living uh, uh, houses and their palaces. And the people of Ad, all of these people, they lived in ancient times before Arabia. And Ibn Khaldun mentions that these people, they fled from the ancient city of Babel. Babel was the mother of all cities. The Bible tells us the Babel was the mother of all cities. They fled from the ancient city of Babel when there was some civil war and strife and they made their way to Arabia. So as far as we know, this is the earliest uh, civilization that we have ever discovered in the Arabian Peninsula and that is Thamud and Ad and others. What happened to them? Each one of them has its own story. Some Allah destroyed, some civil war, some floods and migration. So in any case, all of these Arabs, they completely are extinct and that's why they're called the extinct Arabs, Al-Arab -Al Al-Ba'ida. So that's just a remnant of history. The second group of Arabs are the Arabs we're interested in. They are called Al-Arab Al-Baqiyah, the opposite of Ba'ida. They're still remaining. Al-Arab Al-Baqiyah. Now the Arab Al-Baqiyah are composed of two categories, so don't get confused. One, two, two A, two B. Okay, simple. One, two. One is Al-Arab Al-Ba'ida. Two, Al-Arab al Baqiyah. Al-Arab Al-Baqiyah too, to A to B. Al-Arab Al-Baqiyah are composed of two tribes, two people, Qahtan and Adnan. Qahtan and Adnan. These are the Arabs, Qahtan and Adnan. Who is Qahtan, who is Adnan? Qahtan is considered to be the father of the Arabs. His son was named Ya'rab or Ya'rib. And Ya'rab or Ya'rib, he is literally the Arab father. The word Arab comes from Ya'rab, the son's name. Qahtan, the father of Ya'rab. So Ya'rab is where the term Arab comes from. Now later Arabs tried to make a verb out of it that they were uh, passing through and they were Arab and Ya'ribu. Allah knows best, it seems a little bit stretched to me to take a verb. But anyway, the name Ya'rab became the basis of Arab. And it is said that Ya'rab was the first to speak Arabic. Now once again, this is what we find in the books, but a little common sense tells us languages don't just come from one person. Languages evolve. So perhaps Ya'rab was the one who, let's say, you know, uh, began speaking differently. I don't know how you would say this, but they trace language to him. They trace the Arabic language to him. And they trace the Arab race to him. Ya'rab, the son of Qahtan. So this is called the Qahtani Arabs. Qahtan is his father. Now, who is Ya'rab and who is Qahtan? Amazingly, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. Who is Qahtan? There's two or three opinions. Where, where did he descend from? We all know he descended from Adam. Okay, alhamdulillah. But I mean, which branch of Adam? Right? Where did he go back to? The majority opinion says that Qahtan was one of the descendants going back a number of generations back to the son of Nuh called Sam. Now this is something agreed upon that he was one of the children of Sam. Who is Sam? Sam is the father of the Semites. All the Sam, what is Sam? Semite? Semite means descendants of Sam. Semite means descendants of Sam. Who are the Semites? A group of people who speak, who are ethnically similar and who speak a similar type of language. The Hebrews, the uh, uh, Aramites of the old, the, the Arabs. These are all Semites. The, the, the Nabataeun, the Nabataeans, these are all Semites. Now, legend has it. This is not in our tradition. Even though there is a hadith which is slightly weak. The hadith is weak. It is not in our tradition. It is found in the Old Testament. Legend has it that Noah had three sons. Noah had three sons. First of these, we don't know the first of them, but the, the, the one that we're interested in is Sam. Sam is the father of the Semites, the Hebrew race, the Aramaic speaking peoples, the uh, Ibrahim alayhi is the descendant of Sam. 
His brother, Yafith. Yafith is the father of, they say, the Roman race. The Caucasians or the white peoples. Yafith. And then his brother, Ham. And Ham is the father of the Africans. But this is legend. The Bible says it. Our tradition says it. There's a da'if hadith that in Tirmidhi that also says it. Allah knows best. This is, there's nothing to contradict it, so we might as well put this. But Sam was one of the children of Nuh. And so, Qahtan, they say, this is the majority opinion. Qahtan is one of those descendants, not immediate, not the son of Sam, but son of Sam. <coughs> that brings back memories for Americans here. Uh, not the son of Sam, but uh, descendant of Sam. One of the maybe 10th or 50, we don't know how many generations. Many generations after Qahtan comes. If this is the case, this means that Qahtan and Ibrahim alayhi salam simply come from Sam, but there's no direct connection. Maybe 10 generations apart or something like this. So Qahtan is not directly linked to Ibrahim. Another opinion, and this is a minority opinion, is that Qahtan is in fact a descendant of Ibrahim. This is another opinion. Qahtan is the descendant of Ibrahim. And a third opinion is that no, Qahtan is in fact the descendant of the Prophet Hud alayhi salam. And that's a very weak opinion. And Allah knows best, but the majority position seems to be that Qahtan is not linked to Ibrahim. Qahtan is not linked to Ibrahim. Qahtan is a descendant of Sam. And Ibrahim was also a descendant of Sam. So there is some type of cousinry between them, 10th generation cousins or something like this. There is no direct linkage. Now, when did Qahtan live? One second, we have no idea, but he is way before Adnan. We have to make it a point. Adnan and Qahtan, we mention them together, but they are not the same time. Qahtan is way before Adnan. So we said that his son was Ya'rab. From Ya'rab we get the term Arab, we get the language Arab. Where did they live? The Qahtanis lived in the southern portion of Arabia. The Qahtanis lived in southern Arabia. And they had a number of dynasties and kingdoms and ethnicities. So, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي سَبَا is that Saba. The kingdom of Saba, Allah mentions, they were Qahtanis. Himyarites were Qahtanis. Ghassanids were Qahtanis. These were all from the Trum, the descendants of Qahtan. The Aws and the Khazraj in Medina were Qahtani. These are called the original Arabs. If you want to know the Arabic, Al Arab, Al Ariba. The original Arabs. Why are they called original Arabs? Because they invented Arabic. Or let's say they spoke Arabic. Al Arab, Al Ariba. These are the ones who spoke Arabic. This is Qahtan. Adnan, by Yuna, we know much more about Adnan, where there's little difference here. Adnan is a well-known guy. Why? Because he's the ancestor of our Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ is not Qahtani, he is Adnani. The Prophet ﷺ is Adnani. He is of the descendants of Adnan. Who is Adnan? Adnan is one of the descendants of the Prophet Ismail ﷺ. And Ismail is not a Qahtani, he's from this, Ibrahim alayhi salam, right? He's not from that, but obviously they go back to the Semite race. So both Qahtan and Ibrahim are Semites. But Ibrahim alayhi salam is not related to Qahtan as we said, they're simply distant cousins. They go back to the same son of Nuh alayhi salam. So, we all know the story of Ismail, we're going to talk about it next week in a little bit of detail because there's benefits and points we need to understand from the seerah. Ismail is not from Arabia, where is he from? Egypt? Ismail is Egyptian? Wallahi ya ahl Misr, yani... Fakhr hadha. North of Iraq. So the Iraqis say he's Iraqi, the Egyptians say he's the Egyptians. Where are the Yemenis? Where do you want to say? No. Pakistan, yes, we get it now, yes. Qawla al haqq alladhi fihi yamtaroon. Ibrahim, where is Ibrahim from? He is from Iraq. Ibrahim is from Ur, and Ur is Iraq. Ur is Iraq, Ur is Iraq. Ibrahim is from Ur, and of course Iraq is like the cradle of civilization, right? Ibrahim is from Iraq. And Ibrahim fled Iraq, he made his way uh, with his uh, cousin, they say Sarah. Uh, he made his way through Egypt. The king tried to, 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 to rape Sarah and kill him. Allah prevented that, so the king gifted him 
Hajar, so Hajar is Egyptian, but lineage in Islam is through the father, with all respect to the mother, but the lineage is through the father. And so Hajar is Egyptian, and that is why the Prophet ﷺ said to the Muslims, you shall conquer Egypt, and when you do so, فَاسْتَوْصُوا بِأَهْلِهَا خَيْرًا فَإِنَّ لَكُمْ صِلَةً وَرَحِمٌ When you do conquer Egypt, he predicted the conquest of Egypt. So when you do conquer Egypt, be good to them, because you have Sila and you have Rahim with the people of Egypt. Uh, and that's from Hajar. Uh, so, Ibrahim is Iraq, he's from, Ura he's from Ur. And so Ismail ethnically is not from Arabia. He is from Iraq. So Ismail السلام, as you know the story, we're gonna talk about that next week. He is left as a baby with his mother Hajar in Mecca. In an area that the Qahtanis do not inhabit. The Qahtanis are down south. Mecca is in the middle, central, Hijaz. The Qahtanis don't live there. It's a barren civilization. Sorry, it's a barren land. There is no civilization. It's a barren land. And one of the tribes of Qahtan, Jurhum, passes by. And Ismail marries into the Jurhum. So Ismail is not Qahtani, obviously. He cannot be Qahtani. But he marries into the Qahtanis. And so he began speaking their language, Arabic. And his children, obviously, are now the merging between the Ibrahim Alayhislam's blood and the Qahtanis. And a few generations down, a luminary appears by the name of Adnan. Adnan is a direct descendant. How many? We'll talk about maybe two lessons from now. How many people? We don't know, but we'll talk about maybe seven, maybe ten. Between Ismail and Adnan, there's like seven or ten generations. So we can say around 500 years, 400 years, something like this. Between Adnan and Ismail, we have a hundred few years. So, Adnan comes, and from Adnan, the Arab tribes spring forth. All of the Adnani tribes, and the most famous is Quraysh, all of them go back to this person, Adnan, and Adnan goes back to Ismail. Now, Ismail had many other children, and uh, those children had other civilizations which are not Arab civilizations. So there is an opinion that the Nabataeans, Nabatiyun, there is an opinion that the Nabatiyun were in fact descendants of Ismail from another, uh, not Adnan. And the Nabatiyun are then considered then to be uh, another civilization and another uh, language. Now, the Adnani Arabs, they are called, again this is for the advanced students who are interested, al Arab al Musta'ribah. The Arabs who learned Arabic. The Arabs who were Arabicized. Why? Because Arabic was not their language. They learned it from the Arab al al -Aribah. They learned it from the Arab al -Aribah. The Arab al Musta'ribah learned it from the Arab al -Aribah. And as we said, Adnan was the descendant of Ismail alayhi salam and he was the 20th grandfather. We have an exact precise lineage, there is no difference of opinion amongst all the scholars of genealogy amongst the Arabs that the Prophet ﷺ is the 20th offspring, 20 generations exactly, between Adnan and the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. So the Prophet ﷺ is Adnani. He takes his tribe, his lineage from the Adnan. Now, the Al-Arab Al-Musta'ribah actually became better in Arabic than the Arab Al-Ariba. Why so and how so? Because, uh, we're, we're jumping the gun here again, but just a tidbit, they settled in Central Arabia. And what this meant, therefore, is that all of the other tribes of Arabia would go through them and to them and by them. And because they interacted with all the Arab al ariba and because they're central, they began to take the best of all the, of all the Arab cultures. And so after a while, al Arab al musta'riba became more powerful and more eloquent and became more prestigious than Al Arab Al Ariba. And that is obviously why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala therefore chose uh, the Prophet to be from the Arab Al Musta'riba. So don't think there's a type of deficiency that the Prophet comes from Musta'riba and not Ariba. No. In fact, the, the Musta'riba became better and more prestigious than the uh, Ariba. Now, I went into a lot of genealogy. I, I, I know some of you are not that interested in this stuff, but we need to understand something about the history of 
the Arabs, about the various dynamics between the tribes, about the tensions between the tribes, if we're going to fully understand the seerah. And uh, I want to just conclude and open the floor for question that uh, my methodology for the seerah class will inshallah be something very uh, unique and different. It will be more academic than uh, uh, may maybe other seerahs that you have heard. And the purpose is not just to narrate stories, but the purpose is to tell you a little bit of where they came from, a little bit of is it authentic or not. Because I think it's very important we know truth from falsehood. Uh, my, sto my, my point is not just to tell you stories that will make you feel good, but to give you morals and benefits and wisdoms. So after every incident, we want to pause and, and ask ourselves, what can we derive from the story? How can we benefit from the story, especially in light of modern uh, times? And I will try to be very exhaustive. As you know, this is one of my specialities, seerah. And I have taught seerah four or five times. And this is now, alhamdulillah, yet another time I'm teaching it. And every time I teach it, I add a little bit and I go more and more because I love the seerah. It makes me uh, very proud to be Muslim, to be honest. It's a very, it really empowers me in my Islam. It makes me feel that uh, Allah has blessed us with this beautiful religion of Islam. And so I love to read the seerah and I love to go into detail uh, with this. So... It will be a little bit frustrating if you want to cover the seerah in three weeks, you're not going to cover this in this class. You know, I have in fact never finished the seerah in English. Because wherever I've moved, years have gone by and I never finished the seerah. I was in Connecticut for five years. I got to the battle of Uhud, I think. I didn't finish. Yani in five years, I wasn't able to finish. The same because I, I love going into detail. And so this is my methodology. I, I mean, that's who I am. I'm sorry. I'm not going to, I'm not going to water this down. Uh, this is what I love doing and I'm going to take my time doing it and we're going to analyze and dissect the seerah. And inshallah, my goal is that the seerah is presented in English in a manner that really has not been presented before. Because I go back to the source. A lot of you ask, what book do you base it on? I don't base it on any modern book. I go back to Ibn Ishaq and Ibn Hisham, to Dala'l Nubu al Bayhaqi, to Ibn to uh, Sa'd, uh, Tabaqat Ibn Sa'd. I go back to the original sources. I don't base it on the books that are written in our times because these all books are written on, based on those classical ones. So, you know, this is, I, I go directly to the sources. But if, and with this we conclude, I open the floor for question. If you ask me one of the better books of Sira, I will say that the book of uh, somebody who I had the great honor to study with and my sheikh and my teacher, Sheikh Safir Rahman Barak Furi has written al rahiq al Makhtum. And this book has a story, and I just want to mention the story, and I encourage you to buy it. In 1979, WAMI, the World Assembly of Muslim Youth, Rabit al-Alam Islamiyah, one of the largest bodies of Islamic uh, scholarship and academics, made an announcement that they want a worldwide competition in books of Sirah. They wanted to have a competition to see which book of Sirah could be written that was suitable for the modern place and times. And so they made a competition that the entire world is, can contribute, anybody can contribute, a new book in Sirah, and they would choose the best one. And so over 400 books were written in that one year, because the grand prize was uh, $100,000, I think, which for the time was quite a lot of money. And so a lot of researchers said, oh, this is a good thing for us, good incentive, let's, uh, let's try to do this. And so out of these you know, 400 books or so, which were written in multiple languages, uh, the book that won first prize was the book of, alhamdulillah, the Sheikh Safi Rahman, uh, my Sheikh, and it was called al rahiq Al-Makhtum, which is the sealed nectar, al rahiq Al-Makhtum. And it is a book that is a very simple, very easy to follow, very beautiful book, it's a very good book. It does the job of the seerah in a very professional and academic manner. Unfortunately, the English translation is just terrible. It's just completely terrible. I mean, I'm sorry. I can't, you know, it's really bad. The Urdu I've heard is very good. Now, the Sheikh was Indian, alhamdulillah. <laughs> I have some bias here, alhamdulillah. Uh, uh, the Sheikh was Indian, so he could read Urdu. So he uh, approved the Urdu. He wrote it in Arabic. He's an Indian. He wrote it. He never stepped foot in Arabia. And he wrote it in Azamgarh, a small village, a small village, right? He told me the story that he said he literally locked himself up in his library for four months, just going out to eat and to go to the bathroom. That's all he wanted. For four months, he locked himself up and he wrote this book, Al Rahiq al Makhtum, in very beautiful Arabic. I was really shocked that his Arabic was so strong, even though he was not, uh, uh, had never lived there. And it won first prize, and it's a very good book in Arabic. 
It's also a very good book in English and Urdu, from what I've been told. The Arabic, uh, the English translation is really quite weak. Whoever translated it was not fluent in English. So anybody who reads it in English understand that the style is much better. But you get the facts. You get the facts in in English. So my encouragement to you, if you want something, that you buy Ar-Rahiq al Maktum. And there's another good book that has some major issues. We're going to talk about those, but Martin Ling's book. Martin Ling's book, uh, which is basically called The, uh, the Life of the Prophet, right? The Life of Muhammad. Uh, Martin Ling's book is the most eloquent book of Sirah in English. And that's not surprisingly because Martin Ling's was a professor at Oxford on Shakespeare. And he's a convert to Islam. He converted to Islam. So he was a Shakespearean alim at Oxford. It's an alim. What's so funny? He's an alim. An alim means he's a scholar, right? He's an alim of Shakespeare. Yes. So he's a Shakespearean alim and he converted to Islam back in the 60s. Uh, and he lived a very quiet life. He, didn't, he wasn't a very public person. He was a very intellectual, just kept to himself. Uh, and he wrote a book of Sirah, the English of which cannot be compared to any other book because this is, he is a master of English. There's only one problem with the book and that is there's two or three stories in there that really should not be in there. It's not his fault, he didn't invent those stories, but he's not a researcher, he's not a scholar. And so he just took some stories that he didn't really think about, are they critical or not, and he put them in there. And so this is the problem of that book, that there's just really two, three stories that are just out downright wrong. And, and they can use some fuel and fodder for non-Muslims to, to say things about our religion. He wrote it at a time and place where Islam was not under attack. He didn't really think through. He just is innocent man. And he wasn't a scholar in that sense. He was a Shakespeare alim, not a Hadith alim. So this is the problem. But I do encourage you to own the book and to read it. Uh, and if you do, then you can download as well. Just uh, do a Google of you know the problems of uh, Martin Ling's, and you'll find a PDF or a, a file which mentions number of stories that are dangerous, let's say, or incorrect. So the love story, let's say, the process and fell into love with Zainab. We're going to get to that someday, inshallah. This is just not true. It's a complete fabrication. And I gave in a talk at Yale about this issue. It's a complete fabrication. There was no love story. There was no romance going on. Unfortunately, he put it in there. And he thought it was, because he's a Western audience, so for him, romance is a good thing, isn't it, you know? For him, love stories are good stories. So he, he, he thought this is a good story, let me put it in. But that's not our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is it, you know? And so, and so there are other issues like this that uh, academically they're not good to have. Otherwise, the book is superb. So these two books, I think, are books that you should own and, and, uh, and purchase and, and read. And inshallah, as time goes on, we can mention other books as well. We just have a few minutes. Are there any questions about today's topic? And then next week, inshallah, we'll begin uh, with other stories. Yes? Uh, just so I understand what you said, that basically, the first term, they um, kind of became the So, Qahtan and Adnan. Adnanis married into Qahtanis. But the males are from the Adnan. Adnan is from the children of Ismail. Ismail is not from Qahtan. Ismail is not Qahtani. Right? So Adnan came before Ismail. No, Adnan is of the descendants of Ismail. Adnan's 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th grandfather is Ismail. Okay? But between Ismail and Adnan, there were other civilizations as well. As we said, the Nabataeans, whose remnants are still there. From Adnan onwards, this is when they say that the Arab tribes from Ismail began to flourish. So we have the tribe of Mudar, the tribe of Rabi'ah, the tribe of Nizar, the tribe of uh, uh, Quraysh. All of these tribes come from Adnan, from the descendants of Adnan. So all of the Arab tribes of Ismail, not the Arab tribes of Qahtan, because there's, we said, two Arab tribes, two groups of tribes. All of the Arab tribes of Ismail, they go back to this one person, Adnan. So Adnan is the father of one branch of Arabs. They're called Al-Arab Al-Musta'riba. And the father of the other branch of Arabs is called Qahtan. And Qahtan is Al-Arab Al-Ariba. Okay? And we said Qahtan and Adnan were not contemporaries. Qahtan was way before Adnan. Qahtan was way before Adnan. And therefore, when Ismail comes to Arabia, there are civilizations already there, correct? Where are those civilizations from? From Qahtan. Right? From Qahtan. 
And to this day, the tribe Qahtani tribe is basically the largest tribe. I mean, they, they, and uh, you know, they, they consider themselves to be, as we said, the Arab al Ariba, the ones where Arabs came from. So once Ismail married, and then Adnan. Adnan came there. Yes, from after Adnan, then a number of tribes formed after him. Yes. Questions? Yes. <laughs> from Adam alayhi <laughs> salam. You see, the Arabs can pride themselves, the classical Arabs can pride themselves on one thing that most other civilizations did not do, and that is lineage. One of the mumayyizat,